Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast, where we celebrate individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, access, and enjoyment of the outdoors. Today's episode is part of a podcast series produced in collaboration with Visit Johnson City and the regional partners hosting the Outdoor Writers Association of America's inaugural Field Fest event. Our guest today is Austin Bradley. Austin is the superintendent for Brakes Interstate Park in Southwest Virginia. Austin, it's a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast, and we appreciate you partnering up to help host the Field Fest event for the OWAA. Well, thank you, Howard. It's a, it's our honor to participate. I'm happy to be here this morning. Fantastic. And, and as I was looking at your website, preparing for our interview today, and I have to say, I have a special appreciation for state parks because oftentimes outside of the local area, and everybody knows how great the state park is in your local area. When we travel from place to place, we don't often think what about visiting in a state park because they are true jewels throughout the U.S. And I love that. Yeah, um, that that what you just said is very true. I mean, I will say since 2020, visitation to state parks and national parks, all natural areas has uh, has just increased exponentially. The breaks is kind of unique in that it's. Not Actually, it it is a state park, but it's not a state park. It, it occupies this strange place where it is one of only two interesting parks in the nation. Right. So it's jointly administered. There's about 5,000 acres to the park. It's jointly administered by both the Commonwealth of Kentucky and the Commonwealth of Virginia. So it has property in both states. The, just trivia. Uh, some trivia for, for your listeners, love it. the uh, Palisades Interstate Park is the other interstate park, and it, it's on the border of New York and New Jersey. Uh-huh. Uh, we, can actually, we can actually find documentation from the 1930s where, where the breaks was. We can find artic- articles from the Louisville, Kentucky newspaper and the Lexington, Kentucky newspaper. Um, that indicated that the breaks was supposed to be the nation's uh, next national park that okay. time. Um, it was going to be known as Breaks of Sandy National Parks, which, which refers to the fact that the uh, Russell Fork River, which formed the gorge here, that's known as the breaks, um, is a tributary of the Big Sandy River. But, but anyway, it, that ended up falling through um, and about 25 years later, uh, we, we ended up being established as this very unique structure in the United States and entered interstate park. Excellent. And I, a little trivia, I used to live in Palisades. So um, I, used, I thought, oh, I know where that's at. Uh, it was like four months, uh, trip from Chicago to New Jersey. And I like, okay, I'm going back to Chicago, but that's a whole other story. If I hadn't done that journey, you and I would not be having that this conversation today. So it's a good thing I made that journey. Now I am curious. You mentioned the gorge, and I had seen on the website uh, breaks was described as the Grand Canyon of the South. So elaborate a little bit more on that, if you would. Absolutely. At, at one time, when, when I first came to the park, I've been here. Uh, Oh gosh, 20, uh, let's see, 14 years. I okay. came in 2010. And, uh, and so we, we described this as the deepest gorge east of the Mississippi river. I come from kind of a, a hard science background. So I, you know, wh- when I looked into that, I found out that we're not actually the deepest gorge east of the Mississippi, uh, that, that probably belongs to the new river gorge in West Virginia kind of depends on where you measure from. But, but I, I did, I spoke with, I brought some geologists to the park. The gorge has been studied over the years extensively. And the, so the drop from the canyon rim to the river below is, is one of the most precipitous, perhaps the most precipitous drops from a canyon rim to the bottom of a river gorge 
in the eastern United States. So while we may not be the deepest, we are we're perhaps the steepest. So, okay. so what what happens is that that steepness and the precipitous drop just creates this beautiful view in places the, the canyon walls are a thousand feet uh, mm-hmm. from the river to the gorge. Or I'm sorry, from from the rim of the canyon to the river below. And uh, and it just creates this just spectacular view. The the heart of the gorge is about five miles long, but then the gorge itself is is actually about twelve miles long. It okay. extends from the town of Hayes, Virginia, uh, all the way to the small town of Elkhorn City, Kentucky. Okay, and um, and just a absolutely gorgeous view. Wow, and I am looking forward to. Uh, seeing that view because I mean the website the photos just don't do it justice and you want to see it uh, for, firsthand. Now you've been around the, the at this job and I actually wouldn't even call it a job. I, it's just something you get to do every day and get paid for it. I love it. Yes. Uh, what's it been like to to work your way? Did you start off as the superintendent or did you work you worked your way as kind of a a school intern or something like that? Well, I actually came to the park. I worked uh, for the Boy Scouts of America. Okay. Um, and we would do events at the Break Center State Park. And, uh, and so then I actually came to the park when I first started. I was the park naturalist. Okay. And then kind of worked my way up through the ranks to become the assistant superintendent. And ultimately, in 2013, October of 2013, I, I became the superintendent. In terms of what it's like, I mean, it, it's a we we have a broad variety of facilities and offerings. So I, I have done everything at the park from uh, I've been our our serve safe instructor for food service safety. Um, I'm actually a law enforcement ranger, so I had to go to Virginia's uh, law enforcement academy for 20 weeks and become a certified police officer um on any given day i could start the morning uh, working on grant paperwork for a new trail system and end the day doing a search and rescue so it's it's like you said it's a it it definitely i've been at it for a long time and and it never gets old because of there's just a great variety of activities i love it now, speaking of the OWA, OLA, or Outdoor Writers Association of America, everybody says something slightly different. I, I know you have hosted some of our members before inside the park. In the past, what have, what have they partaked in, the folks that have come before us? Because we're coming in July for Field Fest, a whole bunch of us, a manageable group, but the folks that have come before us and said, yeah, this is a great place. W- what would you have been sh- uh, showing them? I mean, we absolutely love, there, there are kind of two kinds of people that come to the park. A, a, a certain group of people sometimes is they're expecting more of a resort experience. And we, we have some things to offer those people, but I mean, it, it, it is a park. We're focused right. on the natural resources. But then there are park people. There are outdoors people. And and anytime we get a member of the Outdoor Riders Association, we know they're going to be a park person. And uh, so so, some of the things that we've done with members in the past are we've taken them on tours, um, multiple, we've had multiple groups and individuals uh, that belong to the Outdoor Riders Association, um, attend elk tours, do articles, um, for for various magazines, newspapers, um, we have taken members zip lining. I have hooked members of the Riders Association up with whitewater rafting guides and climbing guides. Uh, we offer both. It's 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 a pretty cool experience. Like on the on the rim and the walls of the canyon, you have rock climbing routes. In the bottom of the canyon, you have a class five plus whitewater river. Okay. Um, so, so just primarily though, those four experiences are, are what we've done in the past with members of the Riders Association. Okay. I'm curious too, is 
I know the numbers definitely grew because of COVID, because the only thing we could do is get outside and say dis disperse. What do you see as the kind of the average number of visitors coming into the park on an annual basis? So our numbers tend to hover between 300 to 350,000. We, we have a very pronounced um, busy season that kind of starts in the spring around mid-April and uh, goes through mid-November. And then, it, to be honest, it's, it's pretty dead here in the, win in the winter. Really? Um, but, but very, very pronounced busy season from mid-April uh, to mid-October. Okay. Now, speaking of the uh, uh, after uh, November and before the spring, are there activities that can be partaked in while you're in the park? There are. To, to be honest, that would be my favorite time to to join to visit the park because it's just a complete lack. Of, you can really be by yourself if you're. A lot of times when I go outdoors, I'm seeking solitude. I'm I'm trying to clear my mind, and the the winter really offers. Experience. So we, we have lodging that's open. We have um, 70 lodge rooms, uh, some of which overlook the rim of the gorge. We have uh, nine cabins, uh, some of which are right on the, the shore of our lake in the park. We All the outdoor areas are open, so hiking's open, the mountain bike trail's open, um, the uh, rock climbing is open. But it, it just, again, there's just not as many people who take advantage of the season. Okay. Well, it, it sounds like fascinating. And, and I love the fact that it, it is four seasons. I mean, in, in here in uh, Las Vegas and Nevada, there's the, there's the one season you really don't want to be outside anywhere. But uh, I, I love the fact that you can partake in the park over four seasons. And speaking of lodging, I was very interested in that yurt and uh i i thought well i wouldn't mind staying there for a couple nights that that's pretty cool yeah yeah we we built the yurt which hopefully your listeners are familiar with that but uh they are they're based off of a mongolian structure that that was uh first invented uh in in mongolia and uh, they're essentially a round um semi-permanent structure for lack of a, uh, for lack of a better term and uh the so a lot of people use the term glamping uh, glamour <laughs> camping and uh you know it, it you get various degrees of depending on on which state park system you go to so, some state parks just put up the structure there there's no attempt to do any kind of air conditioning, running water, that kind of thing. And those, those things get pretty hot in the summer, but, but ours has air conditioning, it has running water. It, it is a great experience for someone who's never stayed in a yurt. And it's also a really good way for somebody who wants to get into camping, but maybe doesn't have all the gear to get started in camping. It's very popular. I love it. I love it. Now, I know uh, our itinerary for Field Fest is still in flux in Johnson City, and uh, Ali Castro and Ali are working with our executive uh, team or who are play, helping to plan the event. But as far as groups coming into the park and partaking in activities, what are some of the uh, activities that you typically will uh, invite larger groups to, to, to get involved in, uh, uh imagine like a, a, a half a day or a full day tour. Absolutely. Well, like you said, we're, we're not, we haven't been given any specifics of how the breaks might participate in field, but, um, some of the things that we always recommend elk tours are phenomenal. We, we have a 32 passenger bus and then another 13 passenger bus, and then can actually secure more vehicles if needed. So our elk tours are a really cool group experience because the elk in Virginia, we take people to the Virginia restoration zone. Your, your listeners, you've got the elk at your background. That, that's the area where we 
hate people too. Right. And the elk were at one time native to the Eastern United States. And by about the mid 1800s, they were hunted to extinction. That original herd was wiped out and, uh, and various states have tried to, you know, restore population. Uh, Virginia started its effort in 2012 and the elk have really very, very rarely ever hunted. So they're, mm-hmm. they're very tolerant to the presence of people. We're, we're, we're very respectful of the elk and then also of our safety, but, right. but we can still get a lot closer to them than you can in a lot of areas, uh, which makes for some great photography opportunities. We, we plan these tours at sunset. So in September, for example, like we, we have dinner on the tour. The guests are sitting there eating dinner, watching suns over Pine Mountain, which is a very prominent mountain range in this, uh, listening to bull elk bugling in the background. That's the right. dinner. So, so that's a really cool experience. We've had groups participate in whitewater kayaking. Um, or rafting with a guide. We, we lead group hikes. The breaks is one of the most biodiverse areas in Virginia and Kentucky. So, um, um, speaking of outdoor riders, one, one of the earliest riders that wrote about the breaks, John Fox Jr. Um, described that that say a lovely Island of wilderness in a sea of coal mines. Now, now since that time, the coal has declined. Those areas have been reclaimed, but we are in the heart of the Virginia and Kentucky coal field. And, and we are a great example of what this area of Appalachia would have looked like prior to any kind of extraction from mining, timbering. Um, so, so great biodiversity and a lot of times we found that people who are members of the Outdoor Riders Association are very interested in biodiversity. So we will hook them up with our naturalist or a, a professor from one of our local colleges um, and lead hikes down into the gorge. So so we, we, we kind of try to tailor the offering to the interest of the group. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Now, so you you mentioned hiking, a lot of great hikes, the elk tours, the zip line. Tell us a little bit more about that. I don't know if I want to go on a zip line across the gorge. That's just me. So, so it doesn't cross the gorge. Okay, that's but it, good. But it goes from rock cropping to rock outcropping along the rim of the gorge. Okay. Um, now, I will say, you're still around 200, 300 feet up in the air. So the the detail about not crossing the gorge may not matter. <laughs> uh, you're still a really long way. But All right. The zip line is about half a mile in total length. It flows along the rim of the gorge. It's not incredibly fast. It, it really was designed as it, it kind of blends into the natural environment, uses natural materials. So like the railing is made out of rhododendron. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it, it really blends in well. And we, we kind of, the zip line is more of like a interpretive hike almost with, with the zip line included. So we, our guides will tell you facts about the geology, the botany, the geology of the park as you do the zip line it takes about 45 minutes. Um, maximum group size is eight people. So small groups. And, uh, and you can really get some views out there on those lines that you just can't get elsewhere. I love it. Okay. When you said two to 300, I thought you were going to say pounds and we're going to say, Howard, we're not going to let you out of that. But now I know you meant see the, uh, I get that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you haven't mentioned one of the magic words, uh, of the, uh, OWAA because we have a lot of fishermen, anglers, fisherwomen. Folks that love fishing, what's the go-to, uh, you know, uh, feature of, of coming into the uh, park and doing some fishing? So one of our, our chief ranger is an avid fisherman, 
avid angler. He fly fishes and fishes with spinning tackle. And and one of the key attractions, I think, of the gorge is just how difficult it is to access. So they're, they're, uh, the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources um, stock trout in the gorge, and then a lot of them wash down uh, into the, the heart of the gorge. O on the Kentucky side, uh, the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife Resources Agency also stock trout. So though they grow to really impressive sizes. I mean, 18 to 22 inches is not uncommon uh, for, for brown trout. Uh, down in the gorge. And it also has a really good population of smallmouth bass, a, a native population of smallmouth bass. So if, if anyone is interested in a, it's, and, and it's kind of like a, a rapid, it's, it's rapids interspersed with long pools. So, you know, if, if anybody is interested in kind of an inaccessible, beautiful mountain stream uh with, with good populations of smallmouth bass and trout then it's a great place to fish it it is it is an adventure just getting down to the water <laughs> i can imagine and how about the birding because i mean you're this beautiful area i happen to i love photography i like i'm not i wouldn't call myself a a uh an expert birder, but I, I love being able to take photos, listen to the, listen to the sounds and just being out there in nature. So what's the birding like in, in the park? The birding is excellent, especially in, during the spring migration. So, so Pond Mountain, interesting fact about Pond Mountain, it's the westernmost linear ridge of the Appalachian chain. Mm -hmm. so it's this big, 125 mile long mountain ridge that on the northeastern end you have the Brakes Interstate Park and on the southwestern end you have Cumberland Gap National. Yeah. And it's it's really interesting. Pine Mountain was never mined. The the way that the coal was deposited in Pine Mountain um just did not make it economically feasible to mine. So whereas a lot of mountain mountain ranges in our area have been impacted by mining. Uh, this 125 mile stretch from the breaks to Cumberland Gap is still intact. It's, it's the, and so it, it is a excellent migratory corridor, uh, for birds of prey. We, we see all kinds of different species of, of hawks, peregrine falcons, um, eagles, both golden eagles and bald eagles. If you, if your guests are more interested in songbirds, uh, the, the, the warbler migration in the spring is just phenomenal. We, we have, uh, we're one of the best places to see Swainson's warbler, uh, which is pretty uncommon. And, uh, so we, every, every year we we're, we're known as a hot spot for Swainson's. So we'll have researchers from Virginia Tech, we'll, we'll have we'll have just individuals trying to fill out their birding list come and try to spot a swainson warbler okay now i, I and i appreciate you sent me uh, on a lot of photos before uh today's uh, recording when you and i did some prep uh, prep work if there was not a photo of this warbler in that the photos you sent me i would love one if you could cuz i i will i will send you one they're kind of they are very interesting to people, but to be honest, they're not showy at all. They're just a, a little brown warbler, but I'll be happy to send you. I can always put a link uh, on, uh, oh God, this, so I have the web, I have the app on my phone. Um, oh, I just can't remember it, but it's where I can listen to sounds and it kind of says what are Mar Mar Merlin. Yes. And yeah, so that would be great. I'll put a, I'll put a link to one of the sounds in the show notes as well. So every, you're, you're at the park. People could do some camping, glamping at the lodge, up on the rim, down by the river. Any good places to eat in the area? <laughs> so the park actually has a restaurant. It is it's called the Rhododendron Restaurant. We, we have uh, two species of rhododendron in the park. 
Rose Bay and Catawba rhododendrons. So in the spring, we may through June, uh, we just have this beautiful bloom of both rhododendron and mountain laurel. Um, so our restaurant is perched right on the rim of the gorge, beautiful view out the huge windows in the rear of the restaurant overlooking the gorge Um, and people are always complimenting our food we we kind of we kind of specialize in appalachian country home cooking i I love that yeah um so people are always very complimentary um in the immediate area we also have the towns of hayes virginia elkhorn city going a little further you have the town of Pikeville, Kentucky, yeah. and a lot of other variety in terms of dining options in our surrounding communities. I love it. I love it. Well, I hope I get a chance to uh, partake of uh, some type of food or beverage in the, in the restaurant when we, we visit uh, a visit the park. I am curious, you know, when you want some solitude or just want to spend a day, maybe you have you're out with your family, your friends, what's your, what's your go-to in the park? So one of the cool things about the parks trail system is that you can almost kind of tailor where you go according to, you know, your level of experience and the amount of time you have. So if you don't have much time, uh, you, you're looking for a short hike. We, we have a trail along the top of the gorge. It's called the Overlook Trail. It's really cool because just all along the length of the trail, you'll, you'll be in the, in the forest along the rim of the gorge, which is a very unique natural community in itself. A lot of, a lot of mountain laurel, um, Virginia pond, um, and then all of a sudden the trail will kind of veer to the rim of the gorge and you'll just be, you have this beautiful view and, uh, a lot of people just sit there and take it in and gather their thoughts. If you are, if you have a longer period of time, uh, we, we have a trail called the geological trail, um, which, which actually goes down more into the interior of the gorge, um, goes by some really amazing geological features. There, There are places where you're walking through basic hole in the rock, um, that has just weathered out over time. There's a place is basically a, a natural arch that has collapsed in on it. And the, uh, the trail goes right down through the middle of, of the collapsed portion of the natural arch. So anywhere, I- anywhere along the trail systems is where you can generally find a spot that you can just be alone for a while. I love it. I love it. Now, what are the, uh, the day or annual fees for coming into the park? So there is a $3 per vehicle gate fee when you come in. Uh, We sell an annual pass for $35 that comes with some discounts on other services. The restaurant, we have a water park, um, so so the the annual pass comes with some discounts. Very very reasonable, $3 for a day pass, $35 for annual gate pass. Well, I, I uh, could definitely say I would be investing in the annual pass because the park sounds fantastic. Austin, uh, any other final thoughts you'd like to share with our audience? I mean, it, it's, they could be our outdoor, uh, outdoor, uh, I'm having a blank. Let me start that one again. Three, two, one. Austin, any uh, final thoughts that you'd like to share with our OLA members or or anybody in our listening community about the the park and the experience and really that compelling reason like you need to come here and and just sit on the sit on the bench and over, doing the overlook and think about life. What would be your your thoughts for our listeners? Absolutely had a long time to think about that one, what, what distinguishes the breaks and makes it worth visiting. And for one thing, there's just a very interesting story behind the, the way that the park was formed. So like I said, it's one of only two interesting parks in the nation. The natural resources in the park 
are, are of such high quality that it was, it was slated to be the nation's newest national park. Now, that was pre-World War II. And, uh, and of course, the, the nation had its mind on other things. Unfortunately, the timing of the effort to make it part of the National Park System was right before World War II broke out. And then, and then after World War II happened, it seemed like that effort just disappeared. But the, the quality of the natural resources is, is still the same. That, that's those same natural resources that made the nation think, well, this would be a good national park are still here that we're just protected by this very interesting interstate park structure. Um, also, the, the park is 5,000 acres, but it joins thousands and thousands of acres of Jefferson National Forest. And uh, so we're connected with the National Forest by a trail system called the Pine Mountain Trail. Mm -hmm. And uh, all along the Pine Mountain Trail, specifically in Dickinson County, Virginia, are just these amazing wilderness areas. So, so I, I think, honestly, to, to answer your question, Howard, I think the combination of these phenomenal natural resources, all of these activities, climbing, kayaking, hiking, um, fishing, um, coupled with the fact that the breaks really hasn't been discovered. We, we do, have, we have solid visitation, but it's not crowded. So, so I think all those together definitely make it worth checking out. I, I think that's very interesting. And I really appreciate your gift of these final thoughts. And, and I was just thinking too, as a podcaster, cause I'm, I'm a, a little different than the writer, the photographer who have a very much, their, they have an expertise in their craft, their niche. And I was thinking it'd be kind of cool to, to sit out on one of those overlooks as visitors are walking by and say, hey, come on over. Would you like to have a conversation? I'd love to chat with you about your experience here in this park. I think that'd be kind of a, a cool conversation. I'll have to play around with that idea, maybe talk with you more about that. Yeah. Before before we head out, Austin, eh, what websites or social sites should we be uh, sharing with our listeners if they'd like to learn more about uh, the Breaks Center State Park? Absolutely, and thank you. For this. So we're BreaksPark.com. Um, that that is our website. It links to our social accounts. We've got a very active uh, Facebook account, Breaks Center State Park, and then we're also on Instagram. Um, breaks park on Instagram. So we're constantly sharing photos of wildlife. Wildlife is a huge attraction to the park. Um, elk are actually starting to come into the park itself uh, from both Kentucky's restoration effort and Virginia's restoration effort. And uh, that's really cool. I've not heard one bugle on park property. I'm hoping for that this September. But yeah, we're, we're always sharing photos of outdoor activities, um, events, wildlife, beautiful views. We, we, we keep it positive on social media. Fantastic. Well, Austin, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us here on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast and also being a part of this partnership uh, uh, within the Northeast uh, Tennessee uh area and really excited for what we're going to see when our members uh, come out and pay you guys a visit. So thank you again for taking the time to visit with us. Well, thank you, Howard. It was my pleasure. Fantastic. Listen, stay in the line. We're going to do a real quick close and you and I can have a final chat. Okay. All right, folks, we have just been chatting with Austin Bradley. Austin is a superintendent for Breaks International. Break. Let me start all again. Three, two, one. All right, folks, I hope you enjoyed today's episode with Austin Bradley, the superintendent for Breaks Interstate Park, uh, located in southwest Virginia, uh, eastern Kentucky, and the Grand Canyon of the South. And uh, really, it sounds like a fascinating area, and I cannot wait 
uh, to see it with my own eyes. I've seen it with the, the pictures Austin has shared, and I am excited. Really, whatever your outdoor uh, adrenaline of choices, hiking, elk tour, zip lining, biking, water sports, rock climbing, uh, fishing, birding, having a couple of nights in a yurt, it's here at the park and really uh, you need to check it out. And again, I really appreciate that Breaks Interstate Park is a one of the regional partners hosting the uh, OWAA's inaugural Field Fest event. Now, do go out uh, to uh, the Breaks Park uh, website. I just said it, breakspark.com. We're going to provide the backlink to it as well as the Facebook and Instagram links too. On our main webpage at OutdoorAdventureSeries.com, we'll have some collages uh, with photos that Austin has shared. Now, you can also find our episode on Instagram, on Facebook, on LinkedIn. It, I am always lose track as we keep adding more places where we are showing up. We also have our episode up on YouTube. And, of course, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, this episode will be out there. I want to thank uh, also, again, the Visit Johnson City and the regional partners for collaborating on this podcast series. So, again, if whether you're part of the OWAA and you have uh, some thoughts on attending uh, Field Fest, you're on the fence, another great reason after listening to Austin here today why you need to make the trek out to the uh, Northeast Tennessee area uh, this coming July. And uh, for listeners uh, who are Taking taking interest in this in the park or in this podcast, please like, share, comment on the episode, and let us know your thoughts as well. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there, have a phenomenal day, and we will see you on a future episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care now. <laughs>